Let's turn to Matthew chapter 28 tonight. Matthew 28. And then you're going to look at uh, Luke 24. Matthew 28, Luke 24. The Lord's led me to preach a resurrection sermon. Isn't that good? Amen. Matthew 28, the verse first says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. I like this. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come. See the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly. Come, look, and go quickly. You got it? And tell his disciples, he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed. What's the next verse, church? Quickly. quickly. Amen. They departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did, out, and did run to bring his disciples word. Now you can stick a, a Bible marker there and let's go over to Luke chapter 24. We'll probably be more in Matthew than Luke, but I want you to read this account because Luke gives us some more details. <clears throat> now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came with, to the sepulcher bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Now they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. In verse 4, And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was in Galilee? saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered His words, and returned from the sepulcher, and told all those things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. <clears throat> it was Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales. And they believed them not. Yesterday in my devotions, I, or I believe it was Monday. <clears throat> no, it was yesterday. You get old, it just seems like it's another day, you know. <clears throat> but I read that about the idle tales. They seemed like idle tales. And they believed them not. It really provoked me to, to search and to prepare this message tonight. A Hindu uh, 
Fakur, I guess it is, a Fakur with matted hair and his, his body besmeared with ashes and everything, was sitting under a tree in deep meditation. It was while he was in meditation, he noticed the, the pages of a book or something rustling there, and he went over and picked it up. He smoothed out the pages, and he found that it was a New Testament. He began to read that New Testament, and the words brought a strange comfort to his hungry soul. Well, it wasn't long after that he sought out somebody who was born again, a Christian. He found an Englishman, and he asked the Englishman if he obeyed the book, and the Englishman said, yes, I obey the book. He said, oh, that's great. He said, I want to obey it too. You know, that's an indication of salvation when we want to obey the words of this book. Right. So this Englishman had a black band on his arm, <clears throat> and the uh, Fakir thought, well, if he believes, I guess, and he wears a black band on his arm, then I'll wear one on mine. And so he did. And when people would ask him uh, uh, distinct, if he were a Christian, he'd point to that black band. He said, yes, I'm, I'm a Christian. I have a black band on my arm. Well, it wasn't long after that that he actually went for the first time to a church. And while he was in the church for the first time, he listened to a Christian preacher. And at the close of the service, he gave testimony. And he said, I'm a believer. I got the band on my arm. Well, you know what? Those people in that church, pastor took him aside and he said, you know, you know what that means, that, that black band? It actually means uh, that it's a sign of death of someone who, a, a, a loved friend. That's what it is. It's so, a loved friend has died. Well, the Fakir mused for a moment and then he answered, but I read in the book that my loved one has died and I shall wear it in memory of him. But you know what? The, the more he, before long he realized he grasped the truth of the resurrection. And he took that armband off. He said, I don't need to wear this because my Savior is alive. He's alive. And he said, he, he took it off his arm and the light of the resurrection shone in his face as he witnessed the resurrected Savior. You know, on resurrection day, the disciples, Christ's disciples, were wearing black bands on their arms in memory. In Mark chapter 16, and verse number 9, the Bible says, And Mary, which is Mary Magdalene, went and brought them and told them that uh, had been with, oh, excuse me, went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. They had black bands on their arms in memory of Jesus, mourning and weeping. But you know what? God didn't want them to have those on, on their arm. Yeah, figuratively, He didn't want them on there because He's alive. And He wanted them to know that. And so early that morning, the Bible says here that these beloved ladies went to the tomb. You know, they didn't know what we know. And probably they were taking, the Bible says they were taking spices to anoint the body of Christ. But on their way, I'm sure they were thinking, oh, who's going to roll the stone away? You think the soldiers will roll the stone away for us or something like that? But of course, when they got there, startled. You know, they were startled. The stone was rolled away. And while they were much perplexed, then the account says the angels were standing next to them. And they, they, uh, they told them this amazing announcement. In, in, verse 20, or in chapter 24, the Bible says that they were perplexed. They were perplexed. And the announcement was, He is not here, for He is risen. You realize that we serve a living Savior. Amen. And we can get excited about that. Tonight, we're not worshiping an idol that's made of stone or wood that has eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear and a mouth that it cannot speak through. We serve a living Savior today, a Savior who is resurrected and alive and in heaven. It's no wonder we get happy because He's given His life inside of us. Amen. We get happy about the things that are right and are spiritual, and we should and we ought to. So the angel cleared up their confusion about the missing body by saying, look, He's not here. Examine, look in that tomb. He's not here. He is risen. God is excellent at giving us sensible confirmations of truth. That's right. yeah. He gives us confirmations of truth. This book is true. Amen. From cover to cover, it's true. And if we don't understand it, it's because we have the problem, because it's very understandable by the Holy Spirit of God who wrote that book. If you don't understand it, ask the author. And He will reveal it to you. It might be a radio preacher that you hear. It might be a sermon that's preached in a Sunday school or in church. But God will have you understand it because it's true. And there's many infallible truth, truths and proofs that Jesus is alive. And so He did that. And the women believed the words that the angel spoke. And they were rewarded with ecstasy. The disciples who did not believe, well, they just said, oh, that's nonsense. Y'all are just crazy. You know? 
They're just idle tales. That's all it is. But it wasn't an idle tale. It was the truth because it came from God. You know, the disciples had a difficult time starting. They had a t difficult time starting to tell the truth. But these ladies were excited about it. They were excited about the truth of the good news. Can I ask you tonight, do you have a courageous faith like these ladies had? They did. They were, you know, amazed. And then they said, and then they were given a commission. They said, wow, we got to go tell this. We must go tell. And, and so I want to preach you a message tonight I've entitled Fearless Faith, Telling All the Truth. Telling All the Truth. The first thing that I see here tonight is that the angel gave them a word of confirmation. And by the way, this is the first great commission that was given. Before Jesus ever gave one, here's an angel that said, go and tell. Go and tell. It was given to just a band of women. Isn't that interesting? But they were the ones at the tomb to check it out. And so the angel pointed, first of all, to the confirmation before, with the commission. He said, I have to give you this word that Jesus is alive. And he, he, in, in the scripture there, he said, remember how he spake. In verse 6 of chapter 24 of Luke, remember how he spake. Remember what he told you. And the fact of the matter is, the resurrection is not a bunch of idle tales. It's the truth. Jesus is alive. He did rise from the dead. And uh, it, it, this book is alive. It's God's words. We have God's word on it. He is alive and, and very well, by the way. Nothing gives more support to our faith than the word of God. And in, in any generation, this book is beaten and battered and cast aside. But can I tell you, it always comes back up. Truth may be falling in the street, but it's going to come up again. It will rise again. We're living in a day when, when people, they, this relative, uh, relativism. You know, you believe what you believe, and I'll believe what I believe, and I'll be tolerant of what you believe, except if you believe the Bible, I'll be intolerant of that. Yeah, right. That's what's going on today. I'm intolerant of the truth, but you tolerate what I believe, you know. And a society cannot stand on that. You see, we're, we're our, our nation, like any other nation, like uh, England or others who had the truth and then they forsook the truth, they're on shifting sand. Then it's going to fall. It will fall because God's word is right, God's word is true. God's word does not change, human nature does not change, and God is always right. And so we have better support for biblical events than our own experiences. You know, Peter talked about that. He gave, in, related in, uh, I believe it was 2 Peter, his experience of we saw the, tra the transfiguration of Christ. But then he says this in verse 19. He said, but we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. So what Peter is saying is the word of God, that more sure word of prophecy, is better support for biblical events than what I'm just telling you, yeah. than my own word. You got God's word on it, that he was transfigured. And we have a more uh, a sure word of faith here. And so the angel tells them, he said, remember his words? He told you he was going to die and be resurrected. And he told you that he's going to go into Galilee before you. He told you this. And you know what? We have the Word of God, and it needs to be emphasized, not de-emphasized. It needs to be held up strong and tall. And, and in a society, when it's being put down everywhere, we need churches, we need people, we need people of God that will say, this is what God says, and I believe it. And that settles it whether I believe it or not. It is true. Now, now, the second thing that he had to give them, the confirmation before they could go on this commission, was the revelation of the empty tomb. In Matthew 20, verse 6, he said, He is not here, for he is risen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. There's evidence, there's proof that he was there, but, excuse me, he ain't there no more. <laughs> I'm getting more southern all the time, aren't I? You like that, don't you? <laughs> he said, He's not there, he is risen. How did they know that? Go look. Well, there was just a cocoon there. He came right out of those grave clothes. They just woo, went flat, and the napkin that was on his head was laid to the side. Proof positive that he didn't come out with grave clothes on. He came out with some new kind of clothes on, and some new light on, and some glorious robes on, not those old grave clothes. Amen. Proof he is alive. Amen. He's living. He's not there. 
He is not there. And you see, the angel presented solid proof about the message of the resurrection. You see, Christianity stands on solid footing. Amen. Solid proof that he is alive. Now, we believe that by faith, don't we? We haven't seen that. And Jesus says, if you believe that by faith, you're blessed. Because he told the disciples, you've seen me and you believe. But blessed are those that haven't seen and yet believe. And you know what? I saw Jesus tonight. I saw him show up, show up tonight. You know how I saw him show up, Brother Lucas? In you. In the teenagers. I saw it. I heard it. Did you tonight? He's here. He's alive. You see it by faith, by eyes of faith. You hear it by ears of faith. You feel it in your heart. He is alive. He is alive. And there's evidences. And the fact is, if the resurrection cannot be proven by proof available, then nothing else can be proven. You can't believe anything else. If we can accept the resurrection evidences, we cannot accept the evidences of anything else. So the, the angel gave them this confirmation. You have God's words on it that he is alive. Remember his words. God's words are true. You have proof. Look, he's not here. He is risen. And so because of that, they had this infallible proof that Jesus was alive. Then they were given a word of commission. They've got the confirmation. Now here's your commission. And that is in verse um, 7. And he says, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. You see, there was a work for them to do. You see, when we have a revelation, then there has to be a responsibility. When we know something, we have to do something. And they knew, they were told, Jesus is alive, now go quickly and tell it. And tell it that he's alive. Tell the truth. And so they, they knew the truth. And, and how did they fulfill that commission? The manner was that they were very energetic. They were energetic. Notice here again in verse number 8, he says, And they departed quickly. And then the middle of that verse, it says, And did run. And did run. So they went quickly and they ran. You see, the response to the angel's commission was energetic. Those two works emphasize that fact. They went quickly and they ran. They ran. They walked slowly to the tomb, but they left quickly from the tomb. They did. Now, Brother Wilson on Wednesday nights has been talking about old Father Abraham, remember? And in Genesis chapter 18, he gave us some things about old Father Abraham when he saw those three guests. Remember, one of those was a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus Christ. He saw them, and the Bible says there in Genesis 18 too, he ran to meet his guests. Now, remember, he's almost 100 years old. Well, I tell you, some of us are awful pitiful. You know what I mean? He must have worked out it, went on the treadmill every day out in the sand, you know? He was energetic. He ran to meet them. And then the Bible says that he hastened to tell Sarah to get bread ready quickly. Hey, woman, hurry up. Get that bread done. We got guest. And then he, the Bible says he ran and fetched a calf, didn't he? He fetched a young calf. So that guy, he was busy. I mean, he was just, he was zealous. He was excited about that. And the fact of the matter is, the king's business, as David said when he left Saul, he was lying about this, but God's business does require haste. It requires some energy. It requires that we get up and do something. We need to be energetic. And the fact of the matter is, when we serve God in the church, it ought to be an energetic service. You know, it shouldn't be dragging around. Sunday school teachers, you shouldn't drag in here at 10 minutes till church time. Or Sunday school time. You need to get in here early. Get in your class early. Spend, because there's boys and girls that are coming in. You say, well, there's not that many in my class. So, God's business requires energy. Be energetic. Don't just sloth. You know, when I ask a teenager to do, to do something, or I even ask my boys to do something, I tell them to do it, and I, oh, this would get to me. You know, parents, you know how it is, right? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, it's the truth. Now, some of you aren't like that. Some of you have energy, you know. Man, when I was in my high school, I, it was a huge high school, all right. Well, huge competitor here, all right. Let's put it that way. Man, I, I was in a hurry to get my classes. I was like, boom, move. Let's move. And you know, we need to have energy when we serve the Lord. I don't care what it is. If it's so winning, you need to be energetic. You don't go to somebody and say, would you, you, you don't want to accept Jesus as your Savior, do you? You, you, you wouldn't want you know, when we go up to a door. No, sometimes 
the fact of the matter is, if there's a dog around, you're going like this. You are energetic. You're looking. Some of you have had to be real energetic when that dog's come for you. I remember one time when I was in Pensacola, the guy and I, he was bigger, bigger than me. We walked in this gated uh, area. There's trees around. It's kind of shaded. And opened the gate, and I'm looking, dog, there's got to be a dog in here. Walked up, knocked on the door. This is good. The guy talked to us. And then he said, just a minute. Uh-oh. <laughs> when he said, just a minute, there was a dog right behind us. And he took care of the dog. That was scary. That was scary. Yeah. So the, the king's energy uh, 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 business requires energy. When you have a message to tell, you need to be energetic about it. Now, I know some of you senior saints, I'm almost there. Well, I guess they would say I am a, a saint. Well, a senior. The world doesn't call you a saint. You know what I mean by that. I've never said, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a senior. Could I have my discount? How many of you? No, I won't even ask. All right. <clears throat> Some you do. I haven't. I don't want, when I got the AARP card, Roger, you got your, yeah, you're shaking your head like, oh, why? Why in the world? I, throw the, I tear those things up. I delight in tearing those things up and throwing them away. How many of you do? Yes. Thank you. Amen right there. Be ener Brother Joe, you're energetic. Yeah, man. All right? You should be energetic about the things of the Lord. And whatever our hand finds to do, we're to do it how? With our might. And if it's the Lord's business, it requires energy. These ladies were energetic. And, and that was also, they were emotional too. In Matthew chapter 28, verse number 8, the Bible says that they went with fear and great joy. And then in Mark chapter 16, verse number 8, the Bible says they trembled and were amazed. So we have a great contrast here. Fear and joy, trembling and amazement. In this, you know, both of those things. Now, they experienced then dread. They were scared. <laughs> but they also had delight. They were frightened, but they were fearless in a way. They, they, uh, they had a, 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 a frightment, but they were astonished. The word for amazement that Mark uses is a word in our English word that we get our word ecstasy. All right? So while the angelic visit was very fearful, when these angels were right there talking to them, it was fearful. When they gave them the news that Jesus is alive, they were, they were excited about it. They were emotional about it. They got emotionally involved in it. You see, they were filled with amazement. Can I say tonight that uh, I like real, genuine praise. I don't want this fake stuff that you, the charismatics do and the, the ungodly, demonic stuff of speaking in tongues, getting in a frenzy, you know. That stuff is of the devil. It's, a, it's not the Spirit of God. It is of the devil. But the fact of the matter was when young people sing about Jesus and they're singing the good news or, or the choir singing, lifting up the Lord and, and the Lord just comes down and, and He's pleased to meet with us, it's, there's nothing wrong with you raising your hand. Now, you know, I had a problem with that at first. I really did because I was from the dwarf. Some of you were too. <laughs> and, and, and Brother Flugey, even though we're from Michigan, we know that's dead old orthodoxy and it's, oh. Amen right there. You can say amen right there. Okay. I don't like that. I don't like that. But I want it to be real, Lucas. It's got to be real. It's got to be from the heart. We lift up our hand. We praise God. You shout. And it'd be all right. And by the way, we do it not to draw attention to me or you. No, we draw attention to Him. We want to praise Him. Now, sometimes I know in those camp meetings, people get up, woo, and run around the building and all that kind of stuff. I hope that's of God. I mean, it's, it's okay, I guess, but I want it to be genuine. I don't want to put on, because it brings attention to this person right here, and then everybody laughs about so-and-so. Mm -mm, that's, that's not of God. Yeah. So we're going to be emotional. It's okay to be emotional. It's okay to say amen. It's okay to shake your hand. It's okay, okay to raise your hand. Because these ladies got emotional. It was genuine enthusiasm. They were filled with proper emotion. And I despise cold, formal religion. I do. There's no reason why it ought to be in church. There's no reason why there be, might, there's more excitement at a ball game or a basketball game than there is at church. Yeah. Because we serve a risen Savior. Can I remind yeah. you of that? We have the good news. But then these ladies, and by the way, 
this is so cool, and this wasn't even a message. I saw this tonight. Look what happened in Matthew chapter 28, verse number 9. These ladies got rewarded for being quick and energetic about the message. Look what it says. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, that's what the Bible says, behold, what are we going to behold? Jesus met them. Amen. Wow. So many resurrection messages that I've heard, I've never heard that part. That's good now. They had a, by faith belief, they were excited, they were running, and then God always rewards you when you do right. He always rewards you when you're wanting to do what's right, and you're following His commandments, you're walking in the light. He's got rewards for you. And what a reward to see the risen Savior. Amen. And they got that. And don't you think they were absolutely fired up when they went to see the disciples then? They had proof. They had not just the angel's word and Jesus' word and the proof of the empty uh, grave clothes. They had Jesus. They'd seen Jesus Himself. And that's what they did. So they go with the message. And the message, Luke says, that they told all these things. They didn't leave a word out. They told everything. I even think they even said, we saw Him. We saw Him. We saw Jesus. They told all the news. Christ is resurrected. Christ is going before us into Galilee. If you want to meet Him, go to Galilee. He'll meet you there. And they told all the message. However, that message was, at that point, universally not accepted. It wasn't accepted. You know, we must tell all things. The fact is, you and I must tell and give all the counsel of God. The full counsel of God. Sometimes, you know, I've heard preachers say, well, I just don't understand all the Old Testament, so I just don't preach so much from there. Hey, the Bible says to preach all the counsel of God. All of it. Old Testament, New Testament, it's all good. It's all truth. And it needs to be preached. And I'm thankful for Brother Wilson that is going systematically through the Word of God. We need that. That builds strong Christians. Yeah. We need that kind of preaching. And so we must, regardless of its popularity, we must preach all the counsel of God. Paul said this. He said in Acts 20, 26b and 27, he said, I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So these women who met the angel at the grave, did not shun to speak all the counsel of God. And the fact is, Christian, we should share all the counsel of God. If it's popular or not popular, preach the counsel of God. You know, we're living in a very pornographic, very homosexual age. We should still tell the truth, all the counsel of God. God says it's an abomination. It is an abomination. It is. It's ungodly. It's of the devil. It's, it's human flesh. It's not of God. And God hates it. It perverts His way. His way is one man, one woman. That's what God's way is. Amen. We understand that. But you just need to be reminded about that. And don't be ashamed about it. You'll be called a homophobe and everything else. But so be it. So be it. Christians have done that for a long time. You know, they've been talk, talk like about that all the time. But just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. So these angels, excuse me, these ladies... There were three classes of people they had to tell this message to. And there was a multitude in the Word. In Matthew 28, verse number 8, the Bible says, Bring His disciples the Word. And then in Luke 24, 9, it says, Unto the eleven, and to all the rest. And to all the rest. That's the second group. But then in Mark 16, 8, it says, Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Hmm. So there's another part that we didn't get. That's why all the Gospels all together give us the broad picture. So I see three classes here. The none, the named, and the numerous. The none. The Bible says they were afraid. They were terrified. So they, they on their way, they were so quick to tell it, they didn't tell anybody. You know, there's a lot of people like that today in church. They haven't told anybody. They haven't told anybody. You know, you have a soul winning program, and, and, and you remember what Brother Parker said, if you don't show up, it means you're voting to what? Close it down. Now, it's wonderful, and you're to, I mean, this is amazing on a Wednesday night that all of you are here tonight, but why is it that visitation time, oh, i got something else to do, and we tell none. Now, you probably are witnessing at church. Brother Roger, you say in the woods, God sends somebody to you. That's good. That's great. So, we need to be telling someone. Tell them the gospel. Don't be a I'm not telling anybody. 
We're supposed to tell, proclaim it, go and tell. But then there's the named, the named. This is the original Great Commission. Go tell the disciples. Why did they need to know? Because they were in the throes of sorrow and unbelief. That's why they needed to know Christ was alive. That's why they needed to know the, this message. You know, unbelief always brings sorrow. Unbelief always brings sorrow. These, these disciples had sorrow because they did was proof that they had not listened to the Word of God. Remember, the angel said, Jesus told you that He was going to die, be resurrected, and go before you into Galilee, but, but it, was, it was like, it goes in here, comes out here, they never got it. It's like students in school. It's like sometimes us, at, you know, us guys at work or with our wife. Honey, I told you. Oh, I didn't hear you. Guilty. <laughs> we don't get it. But this is Christ saying that. He said, I am alive. I'm going to go before you into Galilee. So they needed proof. And imagine the first preachers were men so backward to believe the resurrection. The first preachers were so backward to believe the proof of the resurrection, but when they got it, they got it. They did get it, and then they went and they told the resurrection. And so it's amazing that, you know, the, the religious leaders who hated Christ believed Christ's words and got it more than the Christians did. You know what? The unbelievers in their gener generation are wiser than the children of light. You don't believe that, do you? You're just sitting there like, Wow, never thought that before. They were, because they posted a watch, because they thought he would be resurrected. But the disciples, they left. They weren't sitting out there in anticipation. He's going to rise. We're going to get to see it. No, they were at home sulking, because they didn't believe. But you know what? We have the none, the, new, the named, and then the numerous. Luke 24, verse 9 says, and to all the rest. To all the rest. Who's all the rest? Probably the 120 that were in the upper room. That's all the rest that had to hear that. The women reached out farther than any men did of the proof of the resurrection, with the message of the resurrection. You know what? <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Uh, dear women sometimes are quicker to tell the good news, well, any news, than sometimes what us guys are. Huh? So to these women's, women's credit, they obeyed the message. They went and told. I've got to tell. And you know what? When you really, when, when we are, are convinced when, in our heart that Jesus is alive, we just get, they can't help it. We have to tell. It's not, you know, well, give me a testimony. No, I want to give a testimony. I want to testify. I want to tell people about Jesus. I just don't sit there and say nothing. Well, people know that I'm, no, you want to tell it. You want to tell it. Brother Andrew had to have us give a testimony. Why? Because we need to speak up. We need to speak up and tell, tell the good news. But you know what? The sad thing is there was a mocking of their work. In verse 11 of, uh, of Luke 24 that provoked me this week was, and their words seemed to them as idle tales. Idle tales. That word idle tales is um, actually a word that, it's, a, it's two, two words in our English, but it's from one Greek word that means nonsense. That's just nonsense. That's silly. Y'all are just silly. You, you're mad. You're, you're crazy. He's alive? You saw him? Yeah, right. Rank unbelief. That's just nonsense. It's nonsense. You know, the men, these men of God show disrespect to the message that God sent to them by these women. Disrespect to the Word of God, to the angel, and Christ's words. Disrespect. You know, when we don't believe what God says, we're showing great disrespect to it. Well, I know that, but, you know, it's, you know no, no, it, it is it, and we believe it. God says it, and I believe that. And the world today doesn't believe it, but it's sad to say we believe what truths we want to believe, and others, we don't really believe them. How? Why? Because we don't do it. We don't do it. We know, but we just don't do. And the fact is, we deceive ourselves, don't we, when we do that. So, uh, in every age, every age has shown great disrespect for God's message. It's ridiculed as being hopelessly out of date. In fact, 
God's word does not need any tweaking. You know, people write books on prophecy, and oh, oh, the new and revised understanding of the times. Really? Well, you didn't. But you know, you'll never see a new and revised God's King James Version. Well, they do that, but they mess with it. They tweak it so we can understand it a little bit better. Well, the fact is, if you're born again, you'll understand it. And if you're not, yeah, you'll think it has to be tweaked. But God doesn't like that. He wants us to plagiarize this book. He wants us to, to plagiarize it. That's a bad thing when you're in school copying somebody else's words. But God wants you to copy them. He wants you to memorize them. He wants you to say them. He wants these words on your lips. Use it. But don't change it. He, gets, he, he doesn't like that. He does not like that. So they had a... They were disrespectful of God's word, but they were also, they had utter disbelief. The Bible says they believed them not. The fact of the matter is if we disrespect something, we will not believe it. If I don't respect somebody, when they tell me something, I think, yeah, right. You know what I'm talking about. There's people like that. You don't respect them, and then they tell you something like, nah, that's not right. You don't believe it. And you see, they didn't respect God's word, so there's unbelief. They disrespected it. And so um, Satan's program is to get folks to disrespect God's word so they won't believe it. So they won't believe it. The fact is he has to resort to that strategy because he has no facts for his side. So just, oh, it's just a bunch of tales. That's a, it's just a bunch of stories. That's all it is. So, you know, I don't want to be caught believing something that's not believable. That's just a tale. So I just don't believe it all. Now that's what the world is today. So we see tonight these dear ladies, these dear ladies never stopped proclaiming the truth. They were given a sure word of prophecy. They were given the truth. And then they were given a commission, go and tell. And they went. But they didn't just go. They went. They went with energy. Quickly, they ran with enthusiasm. And they told the message. And by the way, that message was rewarded. You know, when you and I go out, sometimes we go out dilatarily. We, oh, well, we got to go out so many. Well, we got to do. And, and the fact is, we're not rewarded sometimes because we just, well, whatever. But when you go out and you're excited about God's Word, you're excited about a risen Savior, we're excited about the truth, and we have the truth, we're wearing it on our face, they're saying, wow, there's something different. There's something different there. This must be true. I want to investigate this more. And we're called, we have a high calling, church. We have a high calling to take this word and to tell it. Listen, I don't know how much more time God has before he comes. I don't know how much time I have. But with the time that we have remaining, we need to be a going church. And we need to be excited about the truth. We don't need to change it. We need to stick in the old paths and declare it because it will change lives. It will change lives. I thought about Brother Nick. You know, how long did it take? A year and a half of just speaking, talking? But you know what? You know what really got to Nick Hagler? Was the fact that he saw how the family reacted with the loss of Brother Parker and Mrs. Parker. He saw that. He saw a difference. And that's what made him say, hmm, there must be something to this. That's what really changed him. It was that testimony. You see, we all have a testimony. And our testimony needs to honor and glorify the Lord and lift Him up. You know, Noah's... Uh, matter of fact, we, the Bible says that to us who believe the message, it is the power of God unto salvation. It's the power of God unto salvation. And so we, like those ladies, must enthusiastically deliver it. Noah's message was esteemed an idle tale. It's going to rain. God's going to destroy the world with a flood. Oh, that's just an idle tale. Hmm? It came true, though, didn't it? It came true. Oh, it's an idle tale that Jesus, you know, died and was resurrected. Oh, no, it was true. It's true. We have a, a more sure word of prophecy. It's this book right here. And so we have nothing to be ashamed of. We have the truth. Let's proclaim it unashamedly. Church, may we preach and teach the gospel without apology to this unbelieving generation. Fearless, fearless faith. And by the way, tell it all. Tell it all.